Uh, I used to say days one through four, whatever child we give you, just take them home, <laughs> clean them up, bring them back the next day. It's as long as you get the right one on day five, it's all good. Kristen told me that's not okay. <laughs> and the, uh, She's just ignoring me right now. Um, the, uh, the other thing is uh, everybody that works during that time will be background checked because we believe it's very important that all of that's in place. So t- you, you, if you show up and you're dropping kids off, you may have the desire or the want to kind of go tour around the building. We're going to ask you to take your kids and get them checked in and then kind of go ahead and exit. We just want to make sure we know everybody that's in the building so we can keep safe with that. So if you want to see the building, today is your day. Kind of wander around, go check it all out, go see what they've done upstairs. It's really, really incredible. I mean, I, I'm so proud of, of this team and uh, what all will get to be a part of this week. Uh, it's <laughs> uh, it's going to be crazy, but it's going to be good. So, um, so looking forward to that. All right. I-, I feel like I have not been on this stage in months. It- when- so I have one week off, and that was tough enough, right? And preachers have this saying, you know, if you're in the, in the preacher crowd, uh, Sunday's always coming. You ever heard that saying? Sunday's always coming. When you get done with this message, as soon as you walk off the stage, you immediately start feeling the pressure for the next week. And I recognize that pressure didn't go away having one week off. It, it kind of went away with two weeks off. But when you have three weeks off, you become a pain in everyone's butt. That's what you do. And, and so I, I just was a, a hot mess. Can we give um, Jen and Caleb and Tammy a big round of applause? I, and they did so good. And I, I, I so appreciate that. And here's a little bit of, of information that I think is so hilarious. During the three weeks that they taught, the offerings have been bigger than they have all year long. <laughs> Normally, I'd say thank you for that, except for I'm going to have to hear this for the rest of my life. But so thank you for that. Uh, it's, it's, it helps to get the summer on through. And so I appreciate all of y'all that have done that. Um, I, I will listen to it. I promise I'll never hear the end of it. And uh, maybe I should just take the rest of the year off. Work that out. Feels good to be back on stage. Um, I, I spoke so fast in the last service that nobody had any idea what I was talking about because there's that much excitement that, that's going on. Okay, so today, get ready. We're in the last Sunday of a series called Influencers, and I have just so enjoyed it because we are looking at talking about uh, the influence that we have in our lives that allows us to influence people for Jesus. If our mission is to connect people to Jesus, we need to be aware of our calling, of our responsibility to use that influence in such a way as to connect people. So we've been going through the Bible and looking at different stories that really speak to this influence. And today we've saved the absolute, I think, best for last. But let me just quickly read down the list and tell you some of the stories that we've gone through. Uh, Week one, we talked about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the influence of a mother. Week two, we talked about the story of Naaman. And really, the influencers in that story were nameless All of the kings and everybody that was in that story, they didn't have any influence. It was the nameless people who were able to bring about the design of God. In week three, we talked about Acts 15, which is the Jerusalem Council, and that was all of the people that were most formative in our faith um, come together, all of the influence that was there, and yet they methodically worked together to discover the will and the design of God. And so we talked about how all of that influence worked together. Then Jen talked to us about Barnabas, an encourager. He gets a few scriptures in, 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 in our text, Not a whole lot, but yet he had an influence on some of the key prominent people that deliver to us the New Testament, whether it was on Paul and his life or whether his relation to Mark. So more than two-thirds of the New Testament come to us as a result of maybe a connection through Barnabas. So Barnabas, someone that's largely unknown, is a great influencer. Week five, Caleb talked about Jethro and Moses and the pecking order. I thought that was funny. And week six, last week, Tammy talked about um, our father, in heaven and our connection to the, to the heavenly father and what, what that does for us in life as we think about that influence, that we're connected to something far greater than ourselves and, and, and what that means. And today, we're going to talk about the greatest influencer of all time, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And, and I pray that as we go through this time, that, that maybe in some ways you recognize the presence of God in your life always. Not just every day, meaning that sometimes he's not there. God is present to you always. And if you're a believer, he's present to you by living in your heart. And so no matter what it is that you're facing, you don't do it alone. I would say you would never do it alone because I believe God always wants to be present to you. But if if you're a believer, God living inside of your heart, um, the Holy Spirit is present to you and and it's the greatest influence of all time. So today we're going to look at Acts chapter 1. If you're going to be following along in your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. 
I love studying the Bible and the new things that we discover in there. So there'll be some things in here maybe that if you've been studying the Bible for a long time, you might see that are going to be new to you. But, but just to kind of give you a, a setup, Acts 1 is the beginning, or the, the book of Acts, is the story as told from the perspective of Luke. Now, you remember the Gospel of Luke? Luke wrote the Gospel account of Jesus And then he found an ending place, and that ending place was on the ascension of Christ when Jesus went up to the Father. That was where he ended the Gospel of Luke, and now he starts this Acts of the Apostles right at that particular point, and he carries on through the growth of the church, and he ends with the imprisonment and Paul awaiting trial with with Nero. And so he kind of ends at that point. So that kind of gives you the setting as to where he's at, but just to let you know what's going on during the time, Jesus has been resurrected. And there's a period of 40 days where he's in this resurrected state that he's spending time with the disciples and revealing himself. This is in the beginning part of that to where he tells them about the Holy Spirit, or should I say reminds them, and then Jesus leaves uh, letting them know what they had to do to prepare for the Holy Spirit that's going to come. So let's start reading in the book of Acts chapter 1. Luke writes this, in the first book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water... But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, and then we kick into gear, kick into the action. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? And we're going to talk about this a little bit, but isn't it funny they're asking the same question? It's like, he's alive, we're back on again, right? He's like, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power. This is the influencer verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. When he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Then this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. And so this is kind of that transitional phrase. And you can see Luke bridging the the gap between the gospel and, and according to Acts. And then he kind of picks up from this place and then he goes on. And it's so interesting that he sets this stage with the Holy Spirit because everything through the rest of the books, book of Acts is about their journey and how the church grew. And really it's a continuation right to where we are here today. So what I want to do is, is go through and teach the scripture. Let's kind of tell you a little bit about it and then come back and talk about one big run-on point. It's not really one point. It might be three, but I think it's two, but I'm not really sure. So we're going to call it one point about which I see as the Holy Spirit as being the influencer in our life. So let's just kind of go through this. In the first verse, he says, uh, first and second, in this first book, Theophilus, um, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning. So he kind of sets up what he wrote about in the book of Luke. Now, something I never saw when reading all of this is this name, Theophilus. Now, there's all sorts of biblical interpretation or thought about who this person is because it doesn't show up anywhere else. They're not really sure who this person is. Was was Luke contracted to write this biblical account for somebody? Some people believe that. I I read an interesting article um, yesterday. Uh, So the the Acts of the Apostles ends with, with Paul in prison. Some people believe that maybe Theophilus was the one that Luke was writing for as, a eyewitness, as an eyewitness account for Paul to be used in his trial as he went to Rome as a Roman citizen, and that maybe this was all the account for him uh, to be able to put forward. That's, that was an interesting thought that I heard. But, but then I saw something that was so interesting. If you look at this word, it's really a translation of two words that, that we know that takes place in the Greek. Theophilus is both theo and phileo. 
Theo is, is the understanding of God, and phileo is love or brotherly love, Philadelphia. And so this word translated is God lover. So can you imagine him writing this? In the first book, God lover or lover of God, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning. So isn't it interesting to, to maybe imagine that Luke is writing this to us? That those who believe and those who love God, that maybe this was his way of capturing us in a name so that we can be aware of the story as it unfolds. I thought that was so interesting in looking at that. So let, let's go on. So he, so he kind of lays out the design of, of what it is that he's doing in his writings. Verse 3, after his suffering, he presented himself alive to, by many convincing proofs. Luke actually tells you what Jesus did during those 40 days that he was alive. He proved himself convincingly to so many people that he was actually resurrected from the dead. It wasn't just the disciples in that upper room with Mary and some of the ladies that were there. Jesus appeared in multiple different occasions to hundreds of people, and they believed that he was alive because he proved to them that he was. He appeared to them over the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So as he taught, he continued to teach the message that he had always taught, that there was this kingdom, this kingdom that was being established and that was the message that he delivered to them. And so, so um, Luke just kind of gives you that insight. Verse 4 and 5. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise. This news is not new to them. If you go back and you read through the book of John, you discover that Jesus talked to the disciples all the time about this promise, about the Holy Spirit that was going to come. They, they just either weren't listening or they didn't understand, oftentimes as we don't. But this promise that he keeps referring to, he's letting them know that this is what's about to take place. And then he references John the Baptist and he talks about being baptized with water. But there's a baptism that's coming with the Holy Spirit. And he says, um, uh, not many days from now. That translates also into our language, any day now. So they really had no understanding uh, as to when that was going to happen. So go back Wait in Jerusalem, and any day now, the Holy Spirit is going to show up. So prepare yourself, get ready for what it is that God wants to do. <clears throat> and then we get into verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? I love this because this proves to me that Scripture is real. The disciples standing in front of Jesus, right there, right then, they still missed the point. That they still didn't get the full understanding is now the time that you're going to do it, right? Like, like Jesus died and they thought, oh, it's all over. He comes back, yeah, it's on again, baby. And they're ready to go. So is this the time? But when you read their words, it, it, so, it so foreshadows their heart. Is this the time that you're going to restore Israel? If you restore something, you take it and you bring it back to its former glory, to exactly what it was before. No, nothing more than what it was before. And so they're wondering if Jesus is just going to go ahead and solve this national crisis, restore them back to prominence. And they're thinking David, they're thinking Solomon, they're thinking Saul. And so that's really still the extent of their understanding. And they're not really seeing the full picture. Uh, uh, th this so resonates with me because how often do I, I miss the point in all of this? And so Jesus replied, he doesn't get on to them. He just continues to move. Eventually, he probably says that they're going to figure it out. He replied, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by its own authority. And then verse 8. And to me, verse 8 is really, this is the influencer verse. This is a huge shift in, in the way that, that the early church grew. This is a huge shift in the way that the gospel, the message, the way that everything started to move from this point forward. He says, but, so in other words, I, I hear what you're asking me about here. It's not for you to know that time, but there is something for you to know. So, so reframe your mindset, your thought to what I'm about to tell you about. But you, not, not me, you. And he shifts the whole understanding and the whole awareness of the way that this whole process was going to move forward. But you will receive power. You will receive power. Now, that word will is not a command, not you will receive the power. It's you will. It's a matter of fact. I want you to know that you will receive this power. This is very important for us to recognize because Jesus is turning and he's shifting their understanding and their, their awareness of something else. You're going to receive this power, the very same power that I had is going to be the power that you're going to receive in your life. Now, it's easy to look at that 
and to think, yeah, baby, this is going to be awesome, right? Because if you just stopped right at the end of that sentence, that means something altogether different. You'll receive power. He doesn't do that. He doesn't stop right there. He moves on into the next step. Because remember, up to this point, the, uh, Jesus was responsible for every word that was spoken, every healing that took place, everything that happened. They all relate on him. This is why they were standing there looking up into heaven. They were waiting for all of that. But then he adds this, and, oh wait, there's more. You will be my witnesses. There is a reason for this power. This power has purpose. The two things working together, you will receive power and you will be my witness. Now, there have been many people throughout the history of the church, mostly in in recent times, that have received this power and in their lives they take it and, and it turns into something that maybe we wouldn't necessarily say is probably the appropriate way, right? So the Spirit of God did not it was, was not sent to make people famous, although sometimes that happens. The power of God or the, or the Spirit of God was sent to connect people to Jesus. There is an understanding and awareness of why we have the Spirit of God in our lives. Now think of this term witness. I always think of it in terms of, of witness as if you were to go to trial. Like if you were to brought up into trial, you would share what it was that you had witnessed. But you know, the word witness is, is two-sided. Witness could mean to, to see something. And I want you to know that when you receive this power in your life, not only do you receive the the ability to to share this message you've seen, but you also receive the ability to see what it is that God has done, to become a witness, to be aware of what God is doing, maybe how things are unfolding, to to, to process and to allow this to to start unfolding in your life where you become aware of, of, of the movement of what God is doing. This power has a purpose in our life. Now, we don't have time to go through this this morning, but if you're interested in doing some study, John chapter 16, this is what we use when we we go through confirmation with, with the students. Jesus is talking to the disciples about the Holy Spirit and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And he gives three reasons for the Holy Spirit. We've we've talked about it in here before. Um, That the Holy Spirit has come to prove the truth, to prove the truth according to two to three things: sin, righteousness, and judgment. and, and And he talks about that because this. The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to capture your heart, in other words, to reveal the sin that's in your life, to keep your heart, that's the righteousness, to allow you to live into righteousness, and then to seal your heart, and that's the judgment. That's the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Capture, keep, and seal. And so when you understand this influence, the greatest influencer that ever lived, then you realize that you are not living life alone. And so in this verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. There is such a shift in the way that the early church had to think. Jesus wasn't just gonna show up and do everything for them. They had to accept this power into their life and they had to then step out and walk alongside and with this power of the Holy Spirit to see what it was that God wanted to do in this world and to see it unfold. Everything shifts at this particular point, at the greatest influence of all time. And just to read through the rest of the scripture, he gives them the unfolding. We'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, that's, if you were to draw circles, that's an expanding circle that goes out to the ends of the earth. It's the same way that, that the, the Acts of the Apostles uh, expands as it tells the story. He said, when he said this, he was taken up into heaven. So he was lifted up, he ascended. And they stood there and they were gazing into heaven until the, uh, the two men in white stood there and said, well, what are you looking at? And he, they call them men of Galilee. And I think that's so interesting that he calls them by their, the, the name that would ground them. Guys, listen, this is your home. Men of Galilee, what are you looking at? And he gets their eyes back on what it is that they're called to do because there was the shift. There's something for you to go do and something that you need to accomplish inside of your life. This Jesus who's been taken up into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful set of scripture that we get to study and we get to see. So let, let's quickly just talk about the influence. And I'm just gonna throw some stuff out there for us to wrestle with today. And I hope this, uh, this speaks to your heart. But the first thing, just thinking about influence, is to me, the understanding and the awareness of the Holy Spirit in your life has the greatest ability to influence you greater than anyone that you will ever meet inside of your life. The Holy Spirit has the greatest ability to impact or influence you than anyone else that you'll ever encounter. Now go with me on this journey for a second. If you read verses one and two, it seems so simple that that Luke is setting this chapter up. But he says in this first book, Theophilus, 
I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. Listen to this. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit, now now think about that for a moment. I have read that hundreds of times. Through the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Son of God who makes a decision, the Son of God in his resurrected state makes a decision not just to trust in his own power and who he is and his ability to teach. The Son of God instructs the apostles, and how does he do it? He does it through the Holy Spirit. Now, knowing who Jesus was, who Jesus is, if the Holy Spirit was the process by which Jesus chose to live and move and teach, then what do we think we're doing by winging it? What do we think we're doing by just making it up? If Jesus himself was willing to follow this process and use the influence of the Holy Spirit to shape the hearts of the disciples, I think this is something for us to really pay attention to. It's so important and so vital for us to recognize this influence and this power in our lives. So just wrestle with this for a moment. I want you to think about this group of merry men gathered together on this hill. Think about who they are. Uh, to this point, they've not been real successful, all right? They're a group of middle-class fishermen, tax collectors, if they're middle-class, gathered together on this hill. 40 days ago, they experienced the greatest failure of their life, many of them not even showing up at the cross, broken, destitute, not really sure what to do next. They are fully all in with Christ. I'm not going to take away from their faith, but, but when you look at them, you would not say, this is the group that I want to go take the world with. But yet somehow, this group of men and women that were gathered there on the hill were the very group that through persecution, challenges, and struggles, ultimately, all my history buffs are going to purse up on this one, overthrew Rome. Because at some point, think of the Roman Empire, at some point when Constantine signed uh, the Edict of Milan, when he said that Christianity was no longer illegal but allowed to be practiced, uh, the, the, the Roman Empire changed. And Christianity became something that was able to flourish and able to grow inside of that empire. And God changed them from the inside out. Now, that's not to say that Rome turned into this perfect empire because we see what happened there. But imagine this group of men willing to give their lives, willing to die, willing to process. There's no way they could have done that by themselves if you didn't understand the influence and the power that the Holy Spirit had given them. And if you won't accept that, let me go one step further. Every person that is sitting in this room has a direct connection to this hill. This gospel that you're thinking about, this gospel that you're hearing, whether you believe in it or not, the message has made it for over 2,000 years from that place to where we sit today. Not because of the ability of these gentlemen and these ladies and their unbelievable leadership qualities, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit that was inside of their lives. And oftentimes, I think we're just like them. We're looking up into heaven, and we're saying, God, come fix this. Come fix this. Come solve this. And here's what you need to know. As they were looking up, it's almost as if the angel said, the power's not there. Don't don't misunderstand me there. The power is here. The power is here. It's right here all along, right in the midst of what it is that you're walking through. The Holy Spirit is real. Now, I just for a moment, I want to introduce just some quick thoughts, practical ideas, ways that we understand and maybe communicate with the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite men to walk this planet, Jerry Brown, I don't think he's here today. Uh, I love when he used to attend our men's group, when he was able to drive and and become a part of that, he used to love talk about how he, he spent time with God. He'd sit on his back porch with his dog, Sport, and he would smoke a cigar, God's okay with that, and he would talk to God. And he would he would work things out. He just would. And, he's, and, and, and the influence that he's had, not only in my life, but in the lives of, of so many pastors and congregants, the building that you're sitting in, for many of you, the chairs, the gray chairs that you're sitting in, he, he paid for those himself. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even want you to know that. Um, but made the decision as the board of trustees, the director, to, to, to be a part of building this building and to build a building way down the road away from the church because he chose to believe in something greater, the influence of the Holy Spirit in his life, sitting on his back porch, praying, talking to God, and allowing God to fashion that inside of his heart. I love that. When I'm struggling through something, I go sit on J- Jerry's back porch with him. 
Sometimes I walk away and go, ha, 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 uh, it's crazy. But it's amazing how God starts to refine that. Now, let me tell you how God deals with me. God deals with me in this way. We have this conversation back and forth, and the conversation really is, is God, God saying, or me saying to God, I'll experience something, I'll go, really, God? Like, really? And God will oftentimes say, mm, really, Scott? So, so let me explain this. Sometimes I'll end a difficult conversation with somebody, or maybe a conversation with a difficult person. You ever have one of those? N- none of which are in this room. Um, <laughs> first service, but just don't tell them. Uh, and when I walk away, I'll go, <laughs> really, God? Like, that person belongs to you? Like, can we just cut that one out? Like, how it works out? Really, God? Like, that's your design? You love that person? Maybe just like them a little bit. Like, let's talk about this. Like, really, God? That's your plan? That's your... Or, let's be serious, there are times when I've sat with many of you in your living rooms or in the hospital, and we'll experience and we'll walk through something where I just don't know. And it just doesn't make any sense. And I'll pray with you. I won't have any words to say. I'll go sit in my truck and I'll say, really, God? Like, really, this is the way this is supposed to unfold? It didn't make any sense to me. And I'll have that conversation with God. But let's talk about the other side, the really Scott. Let's talk about that part. Because there are often times in life where God will say to me, (laughs) really, Scott? Like, sometimes I'll say something to my wife that's not necessarily pastoral. And as soon as I say it, God will say, really, Scott? That's, that's what you're going to come out with? How's that working out for you, right? Like, that's how he says. Like, you're going to reap what you sow there for sure. But, but, but guys, listen to me. Sometimes you ever, you ever go to the, pe- the, to the beach and you see a part of God's beautiful creation. And I'm not talking about the waves and the surf and all of those things, right, guys? Uh-huh, yeah, you go there. I know preachers, it all gets sucked out of us the day that we become preachers, right? And, and, and God says, really, Scott? I want you to remember that. That's how God deals with me. Now, I'm, I don't do that stuff, but I'm just telling you guys, you'll think about that the next time you're on the beach. It's not the first look that gets you, it's the second. So, oh, stop it. Stop it. Some of y'all are like, now I just got to remember just to look one long time. Don't do that. That's it. You're missing the point. You're missing the point. It's not the first piece of pizza. It's the 10th. When God says, really, dude, what are you doing? It's not the first dessert, it's starting with dessert. That's, I mean, that's where you got to process through all that stuff. But, but that's how God talks to me inside of all of this. And if there's nothing else in joking about that, I want you to be aware of the spirit of God in your life, being present to you. That when you walk through life and you are aware and you see that God is with you in the midst of the fun, the chaos, 756 kids showing up, that God is there with you in the midst of all of that. Now, I, and, I, and I know I'm over, and um, I, I, I beg your forgiveness on this, but there's an important part that we need to cover inside of this. So if, if you'll just, I want to go real quickly to Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Whenever you talk about the Holy Spirit, there are a lot of different theologies out there. And, and I come from, from one that believed that in order to have the Holy Spirit, you had to pray for days and months and weeks on end. And there was a sign that came along with that. And that's the only way that you knew that you got the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that I don't believe that God would make it that difficult because I don't, want to, I don't believe that God, that's the kind of God that I know and that I serve. That God wants you to have this power and this ability. So here's what you have to know, that, that when the Holy Spirit shows up, People are gathered and they're wondering what's going on. And Peter gets up and he delivers the sermon of his life because he has the influence of the Holy Spirit. And verse 37 takes place. It says, now when they heard this, this is talking about the people that were listening to the message. They were cut to the heart. That's the Holy Spirit. And said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you, for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Repent and be baptized. That word repent means to recognize that what you're doing, how you're living is incorrect and to shift the way that your heart is focused. It doesn't mean you become perfect. Nobody does that. So, so don't, don't trip into some crazy theology. It means that you shift your heart and you, you make the effort to move in, in a way of, of, of believing different about life and about this understanding of who Jesus is. And then the understanding of being baptized. If you've not been baptized, I will hose you down today. All right, let's take care of that. Let's, let's solve it. Um, but, but that baptism, it's speaking of, of, of an outward expression of an inward faith. It's something that God does inside of your life. But if you've not been baptized, man, let us know. We'll do everything we can. I make house calls, whatever it is, but I would love for everybody to have that ability to proclaim their faith to the rest of the world about being baptized. And and then that spirit becomes you. It's a promise that's been given to you. 
I don't believe that God wants it to be difficult for you to receive this power in your life and to understand that it's there and to have access to the single greatest influencer of all time. Last thought, and then I promise we're closing in prayer. This week, thinking about Vacation Bible School, there are about there's 756 students, and there are more than 756 adults from last service to this service. I want to know if you'd be willing to commit to pray. You don't need to mention a name because God knows the name, but if everybody prays at least once for a student, it's going to cover every single child that we have coming. So maybe that's your extension when you think about this because the ends of the world are coming to us tomorrow. The mission field is going to land right in this building and there is um, a responsibility that we have to that. And so maybe your place is to pray for one student. Um, Parents, ask your children about the lessons. Miss Kristen's gonna send you the lesson earlier on in the day. Maybe you're sitting in the parking line and you can just open it up and go ahead and study it so when, you're, when your children get in the car, you can ask them about it. Um, many of you will round up your change. You will not have a coin left in your life after the end of this week because of the competitions that they go to raise money for missions. And then last but not least, day four is Jesus Day. Day four is when every single one of those children are gonna hear the gospel message. P- pure and clear And that's the day that we really need to be focused and praying. All of them we need to be, but that's the day that I really want to encourage you to be thinking about what it is that God would have you to do and pray and um, just be present to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the greatest influencer of all time. And I believe that if we activate our hearts, if we connect to this greater story that's unfolding, we're going to see great things done here in this church and in our community. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this this morning and, and what you're doing in our hearts and our lives and God, I thank you that you didn't leave us alone. That Jesus, when you ascended to the Father, that you left the greatest gift to us, the promise, the strength, the courage, the peace. And not, we don't just get a piece of the Holy Spirit. That you would give us all of the Holy Spirit. And then the rest of our lives, Lord, that you would teach us to get out of the way so that the Holy Spirit can be revealed to the world. God, we thank you for that. And I know that there are people here that maybe have never opened up their hearts and chose to believe in you, Jesus, to make that decision. And I pray that this is that moment. God, we love you. We give you all that we have and all that we are. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to open up the front to you. If you'd like to come down and spend some time in prayer, I encourage you to do that. I know we're a little bit over in time, but I I appreciate that. If you do have to go, I just ask that maybe you you just kind of leave quietly so that we can honor the people that'll come down and spend some time in prayer. Um, I'll be down front if there's something that I can pray with you about. Thank you so much this morning for your time. Your spirit speaks and moves in me and I am awakened.
Really, Scott? <laughs> we're all really Scots when you think about it because we're all in that same place. That, uh, where we hear the Holy Spirit, we just can't figure out why that's the way to do it. I know it's late, but one, one thought I wanted to share with you because Scott alluded to it. In, in the years of ministry that, that I've been involved with, talking with many, many people, this issue of the Holy Spirit is a big question mark in a lot of people's minds. I think Scott talked about the fact that he, he was taught that you had to pray and pray and pray and force the Holy Spirit to accept you. And I'm going to tell you something. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Holy Spirit is a free gift. It's given when you receive Christ as your Savior. And one thing I learned a long time ago, is that the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit coming to your life, defines you as a Christian. It's a definite event. It took place. But it's not always a conscious moment in your life. You don't have to worry about going back and pinpointing it to a certain date, a certain time, a certain place, a certain location. It's a definite event. But don't, don't get all hung up on the fact that you can't remember when it took place. It's, a, it's, it's an unconscious moment many times. But it's a gift. He knows your heart better than you know your heart. Would you stand with me? Lord, as we leave here today, we leave refreshed. And Lord, the power of your Holy Spirit makes the difference in our lives. There are many things we can do, but the Lord Jesus said that all those things are nothing if it's not done in the will and the power of of God himself, and that power is given to each and every believer, sealed in the hearts of those believers forever. Lord, allow us to use that power. Allow that power to be demonstrated this coming week in a way that will just amaze people, that the lives of these children, the lives of the volunteers, the lives of the parents who bring their children here might be changed and transformed forever. And Lord, we will be praying for one child, just one child, unnamed. But you know who that prayer is meant for. And Lord, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, we give you the honor to serve you in the most, this most important ministry. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a great week.